Good evening, everybody. So we'll just uh, make a start. Um, there might be a few stragglers coming in because I know parking is quite difficult. But yeah, you're all really welcome. It's fantastic to see uh, so many people here. Uh, lovely to see you all here tonight. Um, just going to introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Fiona Baker. I'm a GP on the island. Uh, I've been working here for 20 years plus. Uh, I have some housekeeping notes before we start. So um, no fire alarm is expected. So if it goes off, it's real. So we do need to vacate. Um, so we can go out this door or there's one at the back um, and the collection or the gathering places by the flagpole in the car park, apparently. So hopefully that won't happen. Toilets, even more important. There are some toilets on the mezzanine level where you go out into reception. There's some stairs up there. Uh, there's also one on the ground floor for people with any disability that aren't able to go up the stairs. So that's that bit over. So uh, tonight's been arranged by um, Manx Duty of Care. Uh, we're a very informal group of healthcare workers who are concerned about uh, the impact of assisted suicide in euthanasia on our patients, on healthcare on the island, uh, and on Manx society in general. Uh, and we have uh, two speakers. Tonight we have Alex Schadenberg and Duncan Gary. So the format for tonight is We'll have two, two talks, one by Alex, one by Duncan, and then after that, there'll be a question and answer session. We'll have some roving mics, uh, and uh, there'll be a chance to ask the speakers any questions. We're aiming to finish in about an hour or so, maybe just after eight o'clock, uh, uh, but there will be time for some informal chat. Uh, and you can come and speak to any of us individually afterwards, if you like. So that's the format. So I'm just going to introduce Alex first. So Alex Schadenberg is a Canadian. He just flew in yesterday. So um, yeah, he's doing really well, still awake. <laughs> um, he's very used to travel. He's the chair of uh, the International Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. Uh, and he has spoken at many conferences all over the world. So he's been to the US, Australia, New Zealand, Belgium, more recently and more near us, he's been to Ireland and Scotland, uh, has addressed members of both houses in Westminster. Uh, so, uh, and he's very experienced and knowledgeable about the whole issue, uh, mainly Canada, but also other jurisdictions as well. So we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Alex. My slides got moved. That's funny. Uh, thank you very much. Now, um, I'm told I have about 25 minutes, so I'm going to make sure that the slides fit the 25 minutes, even if they don't, okay? That's what we're going to do. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in Canada, because obviously that's, uh, that's uh, my expertise. And don't hold it against me that I'm com coming from Canada. It's just the way it is. Anyway, we legalized euthanasia, assisted suicide, in 2016. We you could, you legalized euthanasia by creating an exception to homicide in our criminal code, so uh, which makes sense because what the act is is actually intentionally causing death. So the law actually gives physicians and nurse practitioners the right in law to cause the death of their patients, and this is what's fundamental. We, uh, we expanded the law in March 2021, and what we did is we removed the terminal illness requirement, we removed the 10-day waiting period, and we permitted euthanasia for mental illness alone. So that was the expansion in March of 2021. Now, the issue of euthanasia for mental illness alone has continued to be a, a debating point because um, originally they put a two-year moratorium on that. Now, I'm not talking about people for physical or psychological suffering when they have other conditions, etc. I'm talking about mental illness alone that they approved it for. Um, so originally that, they put a two-year moratorium on that because they said we don't have uh, our rules in place to be able to do that. Uh, and then they delayed it again until March of 2023. And now they've said... Uh, I'm sorry, March of 2024. Now they've said we're going to delay it till March of 2027. But I'm not going to get into all that. But, you know, when you're de debating euthanasia for mental illness alone, things are starting to get a bit crazy in some sense. Uh, so Bill C-7, that, that was that did that, uh, legalized in March of 2021. It also created a two-track law. So what happened is when we got rid of the terminal illness requirement, we also got rid of the waiting period. So they decided that if you're, if you're considered to be terminally ill, and the definition for that is really not a definition at all, but whatever. They say your natural death has to be reasonably foreseeable. 
I don't know what that means actually, but you know, it's hard to know what that actually means because there's no real definition with that. Uh, then you could have a same day death if your natural death is reasonably foreseeable. But if your natural death is not reasonably foreseeable, you'd have to wait 90 days. That's how they have it set up. Uh, when they, so by getting rid of that euthanasia for mental illness alone, uh, what remained in the law was that you have to be suffering. But suffering is totally subjective because if you tell me you're suffering, I can't tell you you're not suffering, right? I don't know what you're experiencing. You may or may not be suffering. I don't know. It's not for me to know. Uh, but then you, you, they don't have the terminal illness. You have to be 18. But what's essentially remaining in the law is you have to have an irremediable medical condition. That's how the law is written. An irremediable medical condition is also not defined in the law, but essentially what it means is that you have to have a chronic condition which is not going to get better, right? It's irremediable. It's not going to get better. And so this is where you're, you're seeing how the law is gone. And during this, uh, and I put up the picture because these two people with disabilities during the debate in March of 2021, they were saying to the government that by changing things that it's going to be just an irremediable medical condition, what you're actually saying is people with disabilities, this law will focus in on them. And in fact, that's what's happened. The numbers have just exploded. So in, uh, I don't have the 2023 uh, federal data yet. In fact, the 2022 data didn't come out till November of 2023. Uh, Health Canada was a bit slow in producing data. But anyway, there was 13,241 euthanasia deaths in, um, in 2022, representing 4.1% of all deaths. Now, I do have the data from Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Alberta. And when you look at that data, you realize there's a certain percentage increase that's occurred um, in 2023. And um, basically, I'm predicting there was about 16,000 euthanasia deaths in 2023. And that would represent somewhere in the range of around 5% of all deaths. It actually puts this, uh, you know, and I have to put this in perspective for you. Uh, euthanasia was legalized in the Netherlands and Belgium in 2002. That's when it came into effect. Uh, we legalized in 2016, so in a very short time, uh, we're surpassing them. So Canada's really bought into this quickly. Uh, Quebec had 7.3% of all deaths in 2023 were euthanasia, and that is the highest percentage in the world. So it's become very common, very fast, accepted. But we've had a lot of stories. Now what happened is when you get rid of this whole thing about terminal illness, even though it, the definition doesn't was never defined, what it meant is that you have this situation of irremediable medical conditions. So what it meant is that people with disabilities, as I said, would qualify. And so we started having these cases come out. So this was a case from 2021, the 51-year-old woman um, who had um, multiple chemical sensitivities. Now you gotta put this in perspective. This is a woman who was on disability. She was living in social housing and she had multiple chemical sensitivities in a, quite a significant manner. And she asked for medical aid in dying, and she was approved for medical aid in dying. And she was approved based on the fact that she said, I can't live this way any longer. And uh, the doctor who had approved her caused it, went ahead and did it. That, that, that caused a big stir in this community around multiple chemical sensitivities. And you always get these sort of uh, effects. So it was just like a couple weeks, literally, it was like a couple weeks after the woman who was 51 years old had died, that a 31-year-old woman with multiple chemical sensitivities was approved also for euthanasia in Canada. And she had a 90-day waiting period. What happened is, is that a bunch of people from that MCS community started raising money uh, because she needed a place to live that was not in social housing. Because you, you can imagine having multiple chemical sensitivities and living in social housing, that it might not work out too well for you. Anyway, the fact of it is, is that woman is still alive today uh, because they raised some money for her. I would ask the question, why is someone with MCS even being considered for lethal and lethal drugs, lethal poison? The story of Alan Nichols came out in 2019. Now, Alan Nichols uh, was a man uh, who had uh, depression, deep depression. Now, he was someone who had gone through a lot of ups and downs through his life, emotionally, psychologically. This was not his first time being in care for his, uh, his depression. Um, but in this time, he had actually asked for medical aid in dying, euthanasia. He was approved for it. His family found out three days before he was going to die that he was going to be dying by uh, lethal poison, and they begged the doctors to reassess him. And they said, if you know, if you look at, just look at Alan's medical record. This is not his first time going through suicidal ideation. Uh, the doctors had said he's been approved, and they went ahead and did it. So this picture is the night before he died. He's with his brother. His brother wanted him to live. Uh, but Alan was like, uh, he, Alan, Alan was deeply depressed and Alan wanted to die. Uh, just because someone is deeply depressed, now remember also, let's put this in perspective, 
we had not yet passed the bill to allow euthanasia for mental illness alone at this point. And Alan had no other medical conditions. Uh, he was, um, when they got his, uh, his death certificate, the family was very upset because uh, they were, on the death certificate it claimed he had a condition that he didn't actually have. The case of Donna Duncan was very upsetting to the family. Donna Duncan in February of 2020 had gone into a car accident. She had a concussion. Now, this was during COVID. So some of the story is really a COVID-related story because, you know, during COVID, uh, there was a lot of restrictions on receiving medical treatment because of the whole concern about spreading COVID. And uh, therefore, Donna was not receiving rehabilitation. She died by uh, euthanasia in October 29th of 2021. The family was shocked because they said... Um, how did you approve our mother? Because she was, uh, yes, she was having serious headaches and everything, but she had not received any rehabilitation for her concussion. She had not received care for her concussion. And instead, now she is dead. And so they asked for a police investigation. And the, this, these uh, same uh, daughters of hers have gone to quite a few parliamentary committees, etc., explaining how angry they are with the law. The story of, I'll tell you the first the story there, the 23-year-old, this was uh, last year, in Ontario, you had a 23-year-old with diabetes who was approved for euthanasia who was going to die at the Maid House, which is the euthanasia clinic in Toronto. And his mother was shocked. So here you have a 23-year-old uh, man who is uh, insulin-dependent, diabetic, but he was at this point otherwise healthy. Uh, he had become very depressed and down, and he wanted, he wanted to die. Uh, so he was approved based on having an irremediable medical condition. Okay. And what happened is his mother then found out about it, and she got very upset. She was thinking, how could you, how could you do euthanasia on my son? How could this happen? And she, had, she got the name of the doctor who was willing to do it. So she started a big campaign, and we promoted her petition, and she started a campaign with the media and the Ministry of Health, and she named the doctor who was going to do the euthanasia death. And I guess in the end, the doctor decided the uh, heat was too hot for him, and he decided not to do it. So you know, the young man is still alive today. Amir Farsu is another type of story. You see him in the picture. So this is a whole case around disabilities. Now, um, first of all, uh, you'll be told, and it's correct, you cannot have euthanasia in Canada for poverty. That's true. You can't have euthanasia. Poverty is not a reason you can have it for. Absolutely correct. But in the case of Amir, he was, uh, nor homelessness. You can't have it for homelessness. But Amir was in a situation where he's on disability benefits, he's living in a subsidized housing unit, and the place was purchased by a new owner, and he was told he had to leave because they were going to redo the building. And Amir is saying, okay, there is no place, he was living in St. Catharines, he said there's no place in St. Catharines where the non-subsidized rent is cheap enough that he can afford to live. He says, I can't find an apartment. So he applied and he was approved for euthanasia based on his fear of homelessness. There was a GoFundMe campaign that was set up by some people in St. Catharines and they raised enough money that they found a mere place to live. But the key was the fact that on disability, he did not receive enough money to be able to even afford to pay a monthly rent. And, um, and that's based on the fact that, of course, there's waiting lists for people to get on subsidized housing. When you lose your subsidized housing spot, you don't just immediately get put on the top of the list. You're back on the bottom of the list. And he couldn't afford to live. The veterans issue, this, is really, this really blew up in Canada in a big way. So we had a veterans affairs worker advocate to a Canadian soldier with PTSD. So this was a soldier who served our country in Afghanistan. He had PTSD. He was seeking help, psychiatric help for his PTSD. And so he contacted Veterans Affairs for assistance. And he was told by the Veterans Affairs worker, has he, has he asked for medical aid in dying? Does he, has he considered medical aid in dying? Now, this uh, veteran was so angry by this that he actually went to the U.S. for treatment. That's, that is the truth of the story. He went to the U.S. for treatment. But he went to the media because he was absolutely shocked by the fact that when he went to Veterans Affairs, he was told, have you considered medical aid in dying? And then what happens, our, our Veterans Affairs Minister at the time, his name was Lawrence McCauley, he went to the media immediately after the story hit the media. He, he had a press conference the very next day saying this was one bad case. This was, uh, you know, this was a rogue employee, one bad case. This shouldn't have happened. And, of course, by doing that, more cases came up in the media. Because, you know, you, when he announced to the world it was one bad case, obviously others who had the same thing happened. So we, we ended up finding out there was at least six, at least six cases like that. 
At least two of them had died by euthanasia. And, um, and then, of course, they thought things were settling down, and then Christine Gauthier went to the media. She's uh, a woman who served our country in the military. She became injured. She's a, um, a Special Olympics. She became a Special Olympics athlete. She's a little bit older now. Anyway, and um, so she served our country. She's asking Veterans Affairs for what? Help with, uh, with putting a wheelchair ramp in her house. Does that seem unreasonable? Certainly she actually qualifies for that too. Um, and she was actually sort of contacted them over and over again because they were saying, well, we don't have budget for that and that kind of thing. And she kept on sort of, she was saying she was, how was she? she was trying to be the squeaky wheel to get the grades because she needed her wheelchair ramp. She needed help with putting that in. And they said to her, Madam, if you are so desperate, we can give you medical assistance in dying. Now this shows you a shift in the culture but when Christine went to the media about that, obviously speaking, that showed you what was going on. This is a more recent story, Catherine Mentler. Now remember, we had not had in place euthanasia for mental illness alone at this point. But on June of 23 and 23, Catherine was experiencing suicidal ideation. So if you actually go to the newspaper article and read it, you, you realize she's admitting she's gone through a lot of mental health issues. She's, she knew she was experiencing suicidal ideation and she did not want to do something to herself, untoward to herself, she went to the Vancouver General Hospital for help. And she was told by the counselor there that there was no available beds. Okay. All the psychiatric beds are full. Okay. She was told, now remember, this is June of 2020 to 23. She was told, you cannot see a psychiatrist until November at the earliest. Now, I think June to November. And then she was told, have you considered medical assistance in dying? So she was very upset by this. She, uh, she, uh, didn't immediately go to the media because she was in a bit of a crisis at that time in her life. There's a lot more to the story I could tell you because it shows you uh, how, how, how bad things were. Uh, but the fact of it is, is that uh, um, when someone's going to the hospital because they're experiencing suicidal ideation, the concept of bringing up medical assistance in dying is not very helpful, especially since she wasn't seeking that. She was seeking help, right? There's a recent court case that just happened yesterday in Alberta and it's a concerns a 27-year-old autistic woman. She actually, this is actually a Calgary case, who's been approved for euthanasia. So her father, now she lives with her, her, her mother and father. This case hits me hard because I have a, a son, Peter, who's 30 years old and he's autistic. So I understand autism reasonably well. I know there's a spectrum, so I understand there's a variance. Nonetheless, the father of, of this woman has been trying to stop the euthanasia death He's very clear that uh, she does not have an irreme irremediable medical condition. In fact, he went to the court on Monday showing the medical records that he had in his ownership, proving that there's no irremediable medical condition with his daughter. And then, in fact, that uh, she, uh, she was approved based on an unknown cause of pain. So she's telling the doctors that she's suffering, and she was approved for medical aid in dying, and it says right on her application, their approval was, it's an unknown cause of suffering. So they, they haven't even, uh, if she is suffering greatly, and it could be true, I don't know, I'm not inside her body, I don't know, uh, they don't know what the cause of it is. So you don't think you'd be killing somebody when you don't know what their cause of their pain is, but nonetheless. Uh, this case here, these are more recent cases out of British Columbia, and it shows you that we have a real problem in, on, in Canada, in certain pr places in particular, with care. So what you had is, this case came out first, Alison Duclazo, she was diagnosed with abdominal cancer, and that was last year, and she was offered euthanasia rather than treatment. In fact, she was told by the, uh, her oncologist that with your type of cancer, uh, we don't provide treatment for that because your odds of recovery are very low. She uh, actually went then to, she, con she did her Google searches, etc. She contacted places in the U.S. She had the wherewithal to actually go to the U.S., which is actually not a common situation for everybody, right? And she ended up receiving treatment at the Mercy Medical Center in Baltimore. She's, she went into total remission. She's fine. The picture here you see of her is last November in Hawaii. Uh, she went to Hawaii for her honeymoon. Now that story hit the media because Allison was wanting the BC Ministry of Health to pay for her medical treatment that she received at Mercy Medical Center in Baltimore because in British Columbia, they weren't offering her the treatment. So therefore, she's saying, well, you know, we have universal health care. You should be paying me for the treatment I received. So that's what she's, that's why that story came out. 
But then when that story came out, other stories started coming out. So there was the story of Mary Griffin. This came out like just a couple of days after Allison's story hit the media. Mary Griffin's story, her family was upset because uh, she died by euthanasia after she was forced to wait 10 weeks to see an oncologist for her cancer. Uh, she was diagnosed on March 17, 2023. So the backlog in seeing an oncologist meant that she had to wait 10 weeks before she could see the oncologist. And at that point, the oncologist had said to her, well, your cancer is spread to the point and et cetera. There was the case that, that was, uh, it's been uh, multiple times in the media, and that's the case of Dan Quayle, because his widow and his family are very upset with the fact he died on December 5th, 2023. He was approved for treatment, so he went to the oncologist. He was approved for his cancer treatment, but then he had to wait in the queue for his treatment. And after 10 weeks of waiting, he was told, your cancer has spread. And uh, he, quote, quote, chose to die by euthanasia. There's the family of Joan Rowaway. Now, you can't make the story up. This is not an, you know, if you ask me, I'll send you the story and the media article that connects to it. Uh, so Joan had cancer also. She's in British Columbia. And she came to the point where they said there's no further medical treatment that could help you. That, that's, that's fine. Like, there's no issue of she's dying. That's fine. But in that conversation with the oncologist, the issue of medical aid and dying come up, came up. Joan was very clear. She never asked for medical aid and dying. But the oncologist had approved her and signed her off for medical aid and dying. So then the family, so she's living with her family as she's dying. Her, her daughter and her son-in-law took her in. They're caring for her as she's dying. And uh, they got a call saying, um, your, uh, your mother's maid has been scheduled, so we're coming to pick up your mother. And the family's like... Um, no, my mother, our mother has not asked for medical aid in dying. And they said, you're denying her her right to die. They sent two people over to go pick her up. And the family refused to let them in the house. So then the, finally, uh, the BC Health Authority, which was Fraser Health, Fraser Health is just outside of Vancouver. They sent someone over who was a little, little bit more conciliatory and actually asked Joan, Joan, do you want medical aid in dying? And she said, no. Um, it gets a little bit crazy. Euthanasia for mental illness has been a big issue. It's been debated in Canada very heavily. Now, why did we go to the euthanasia for mental illness issue? So that was in 2021. The argument was that it is uh, not, um, there's, if, you do, if you deny someone with mental illness, euthanasia, but you can offer it to people who are suffering with physical conditions. Remember, the law says now that you have to have an irremediable medical condition. So obviously, the question is, if you have a mental illness cannot be irremediable in its condition. And, and, and the argument was is if they have an irremediable mental, medical condition, that this would be discrimination to deny them euthanasia, right? Because it's a, a legal thing. So then that was added to the law. So now we've had this situation where, you know, so I, I refer to Dr. Sonia Gainoff because he's one of the uh, key psychiatrists in Canada. He teaches at the University of Toronto. He's a past president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association. And he's actually in favor of MAID, euthanasia. He's in favor of it. He was the head of his euthanasia committee at, uh, at his hospital. But he's opposed to it for mental illness. And, as a, and he's a psychiatrist. So he said, you know, he's testified very clear. It's impossible to predict whether mental illness conditions are irremediable. He also makes the clear statement. It's, you know, you're talking about killing someone who has a questionable ability to consent. You know, it starts becoming uncomfortable, obviously. The Council of Canadians with Academy, uh, Academies also concluded in their statement, in their, in their paper, there's no evidence supporting that made solely for mental illness can be appropriate, okay? And what shocked me is that, uh, so we were going to have euthanasia for mental illness start on March 17th this year. Now it's been delayed until March 17th of 2027. The government had a conference in October in Victoria, BC, where they're looking at the question of how they would implement this. And uh, one of the issues was people with substance use disorders. And so this Dr. David Martell was asked to do research into this and make a presentation. And the, and the, and the answer was that, yes, some people, their drug addictions are based on a mental illness. Therefore, some people with drug addictions could qualify for medical aid in dying. And of course, he said in the, to the newspaper article, these conditions would be very tricky. Nonetheless, it would be an option. So uh, parliamentary, uh, we had a parliamentary debate on the issue of euthanasia for minors. 
and also uh, the issue of euthanasia by advanced consent, meaning that you would put it in your power of attorney document. And the uh, parliamentary committee came out in, uh, is that on my next slide? No, it's here. On uh, February 15th of 2020, 2023, saying that we should have euthanasia for, for mature minors. Now, mature minors is defined as someone who is under the age of 18, but determined by a, basically a test that they're capable of consenting to the question at hand, right? So that's not based on an age. But during the, uh, the whole committee hearings, though, before that report came out, the committee hearings that were leading up to that report, the Quebec College of Physicians uh, told the committee that they not only supported euthanasia for mature minors, they believed in infant euthanasia. They believed that this should be permitted also. Now, you have to understand this point. Now, you might say to me, yes, but some Alex, there might be some newborn child born with significant disabilities. You know, usually that child would die on its own. I'm not saying, saying uh, but the point of it is, is we legalize this under this concept that it would be competent adults who are capable of consenting, and now we're talking about infanticide. Right? Euthanasia was sold to the cultures enabling personal autonomy and choice. You know, it's my body, my choice, that's what it was argued. We're told that it's for people who are suffering and nearing death. We're told that euthanasia is not a form of suicide because people are rationally choosing to die. In fact, all of these points are either philosophically wrong or usually not the case. So the big question I always say is, why do people ask for euthanasia? This is the big question. And we're told that this is about people who are suffering and nearing death. And in fact, the reality is, is that does happen, yes. But those are the minority. The reality is, is that most people ask for euthanasia, die by euthanasia, because they're going through a difficult health condition, whether that be physical or psychological. They're feeling depressed, lonely. They're experiencing feelings of hopelessness, and they believe their life has lost meaning, purpose, or value. Legalization is not about freedom. When you legalize euthanasia, it is about abandoning people. These are deaths of despair. Like the Netherlands, Belgium, Canada is now debating uh, euthanasia for children, euthanasia for incompetent people, euthanasia by advanced request. Uh, people uh, with Alzheimer's, dementia, mental illness. These are all things we're debating in Canada. These are all common topics. There's other topics too. And the reason is because there, it was only one clear line. That clear line was either we can cause your death or we can't cause your death. Once you cross that line, what happened very quickly is the debate was then about what were the acceptable reasons and who can do the act, Right? Those are the only two things. Because in Canada, you're allowed to kill somebody. That's not the issue. A physician or a nurse is allowed to do it. There's an exception in our criminal code. They can do it once they've signed you off. I can get into that further if you ask me some questions. But now the question is, well, who can we do and for what reasons? And there's a lot more to it than that. And um, thank you very much. I've got a pamphlet here called Canada's, Youth, uh, Canada's Made Laws Gone Mad. I've got a few there. Anybody who wants them can have it. You can see I don't have that many. So obviously speaking, uh, they're available first come, first serve. Don't start running up till afterwards. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, I'm sure there'll be quite a few questions already in people's heads, so keep them there for now. Uh, and we're going to have our next speaker, who is Dr. Duncan Gary who is a consultant geriatrician at Nobles Hospital. He's going to give uh, a more local point of view on this. How do I change it over? Ah, there we go. Perfect. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, this will be a lot more local and parochial. That's kind of me all over. Um, so it's it's one person's view of euthanasia and assisted dying who happens to be a doctor. Um, I am uh, instructed by Manx Care to let everyone know that I'm not speaking for Manx Care on behalf of them for any reason at all. So this is personal views uh, and that's all. So um, mental note self to introduce self. So my name is Duncan Gerry. Um, I've been an Isle of Man resident for just over four years and I brought my family and my life over here. So I feel part of the, uh, the, the society now. Um, and um, I'm keen to try and make sure we do the best things we can here. Um, I've been a geriatrician since 2005, and for today's conversation, that, there's one thing that's really important about that. I have seen a lot of death and dying. Um, the stats for somebody in my uh, profession 
is that somewhere in the region of 10 to 14 percent of everyone that comes in under my care will die in hospital and the vast majority of people that die in hospital don't need hospice care because the hospice has a limited resource and and we manage the vast majority of those deaths over the years so i have seen a lot of life i have seen a lot of death i've confronted the conversation with a lot of people on the way and i've been there to help manage the the living um, and and the dying in that process um i'm also a scientific by background i went to university and um uh, for what it's worth, I got brought up in the Church of England tradition, but I have no faith of my own. Um, at university, we were taught medical ethics, and there's quite a lot in, in, in medical ethics. One of the main things that has always struck me as critically important in any decision-making process is the conversation about the greatest good for the greatest number. I'm, I'm very much a fan of, of that. Scientific method is all about percentages. It's the way we're taught. We're, we're taught to say, well, if we give this, will we help more people than we hurt? So both my ethical and my scientific background lead me to the, to, to the thought process of how do I approach things, and it's to try and look at the, the greater good for the greatest number. Autonomy is, is part of medical ethics. There's no denying that. I've always put autonomy into a wider context that no one person's autonomy should negatively impact on everyone else around them. Um, I don't have the autonomy to, you know, well, actually, I do have the autonomy to drive us fast. I want on some roads here. That's a wrong example now, isn't it? Oops. Uh, you know what I mean? There's things I'm not allowed to do for the greater good of the greater number. So I don't try and exert my autonomy by doing what I'm not allowed to do. Um, so, yes, so that, that's where I put autonomy. So uh, this is a difficult conversation and a difficult topic. So I always think about what's the argument in favour of the, upper, the other side. And I think, really, it comes down to this thing, which is pain and suffering is bad and choice is good. Yeah, why not? I mean, why shouldn't I be allowed to choose what I want when I want it? Because that's what it is. To not have suffering, that's exactly what I want. And it's really, I mean, a lot of times I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people and often people get to, yeah, well, I want it. And that's where they stop. They don't go any further than that because it's an obvious emotional response. Well, why shouldn't I? But my my background and, and, and the way I am makes me think further about what might be going on in the other way. So, uh what is making me feel globally that the argument against is, is where I fall. Um, mission creep, that's what I call the experience that we heard from Canada. And my reading around the subject from mission creep is that it happens. Um, it's uh, very easy for a lawmaker to say that my version of the law will never ever change, but that's not the way it works in the law because politicians get to change what other people did. It's natural evolution. Uh, and even, I understand, on the Isle of Man, um, although we've gone for initially a six-month prognosis with a terminal diagnosis, there's already calls to give intolerable suffering the nod instead. So we're already going down the route of mission creep. It's going to happen. Um, and I think I'm going to echo what Alex said as well. My understanding was always that the reason to choose assisted dying is a perception of pain. Pain is mine and it's not yours. You can't tell me what my pain is. How do you validate my pain against yours? Why have I got pain and you're not letting me what somebody else has pain has? And that's why in Canada they're discussing that the pain of mental health is a reason to, to uh, ask your doctor to kill you. Kill you. It's, 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 an, it's an inevitable consequence. You can't stop the idea of carrying on and inevitably the lawmakers go, yes, you're right, I can't differentiate the two so you can have it as well. So you start out with the good intentions of being very controlled and lots of people say, but the safeguards and we can put them in. The mission creep comes. Mission creep is true. It will happen. And it seems to be that everywhere that does it goes down that route. Um, oh, I haven't finished my, my argument four, sorry. <laughs> um, safeguards. Um, the question about safeguards is, are they absolute and 100%? And if they're not then they're not fully safeguards. And hearing a lot about the Canadian story as well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm even more convinced that it's difficult to safeguard when it's perception and when it's judgment calls. Um, it's also difficult to go back and ask for somebody after they've done it were they really meant to, because they're not there anymore, are they? <laughs> so you can't go back and check. Um, and, and if we take at face value the Canadian experience that safeguards cannot be watertight and I don't believe they can and people will inevitably die you've got to ask the question how many people die to let me have my choice and that's that's one of my main conversation pieces and in, in the in the thought um, I do have a bit of a problem with the process particularly um, 
in the Isle of Man version of doing it, um, and it sounds like Canada as well, where you've got to be able to consent to what's going on and have uh, decision making. A um, bit of my background, so in the UK, I uh, consulted for 14 years, I was the Mental Capacity Act UK lead in a couple of the hospitals in London where I worked. Um, so I've got more pedigree and background than most of my colleagues and certainly more than a lot of my colleagues on the Isle of Man because we haven't quite got there with introducing our law yet. And I really struggle sometimes to say yes or no, this person on the balance of probability does have the ability to make their mind up with this choice. And interestingly, my experience over the many years of doing it is that psychological issues and psychiatric issues are the ones where I struggle the very most. And if we're talking about pain, the perception of pain, a terminal diagnosis, which often is associated with depression, it's not as far stretched to think that people who are choosing dying at a time of distress are impacted by the distress and they may feel differently sooner or later or in the future. So it's, it's very difficult for me. I certainly really struggle with capacity decision making. I've done it a lot. I've done it many times. And the ones I struggle with where psychological and psychiatric issues are at the forefront of the decision making process because it's really hard to know what is behind somebody else's eyes. Um, so, uh, local and parochial. Um, I uh, will uh, say out loud now that I'm uh, now part of the Isle of Man Medical Society, um, and me and some of my colleagues, two in the room today, um, got together to, at the request of the, the Executive uh, Committee, to look through the clauses. And I think that, particular to the Isle of Man, the law that is being proposed to us has some, has some really serious challenges. Um, I have had the opportunity to present these to Manx Care as well, so that we're trying to share this, 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 these concerns. So this is, this is actually the Isle of Man Medical Society's views, um, but certainly I agree with them. First one, recruitment. Um, if the Isle of Man had been the only place in the British Isles that facilitated assisted dying and, and euthanasia, I probably wouldn't have come, is the truth. Um, I've got a number of colleagues who I've directly asked, and they've said, I'd leave. Um, we can't train doctors on the Isle of Man. We're not the only profession, just to let you know. I, I know that, but we are an important part of healthcare services. Um, so we can't train doctors here. So everybody has to be an import of some variety. And if we make it difficult to bring people over because the environment that we work in, it will further deplete our ability to bring people over to work over here. And we need people to come to work. I mean, I love living on the Isle of Man. I really do. But there are, it's definitely a pros and cons. Getting off the island to see my family that live in the UK still is really difficult. Some people have come to the Isle of Man and left because of the, the, the nature of the Isle of Man. It makes it impossible for them to live their life. If we have another thing that blocks people, and for, for some people this is particularly important, it, it really will negatively impact on recruitment. And, and the, the specialities that are most likely to object to assisted dying, general practice, geriatricians, uh, um, palliative care uh, are often the people who are most impacted about the decision making process as well so we worry um, health tourism uh, an interesting one um, as the law stands you have to be an Isle of Man resident for a year um, and you have to be within six months of dying um, the Isle of Man is a lovely place to live if you have connections and you get a terminal diagnosis why wouldn't you come to the Isle of Man because you know at the end of it all you can ask someone to, to assist your dying um, that's reasonable. I can't, I'm not going to stop somebody or damn them for, for, for doing that. The consequence would that people move with a serious health condition, bring with them serious health costs. Um, we have no um, Isle of Man based oncology team. It's all across. There's, there are teams here that provide oncology services, but people go across for treatment. Um, and it's not a cheap part of our service. There's no denying that. So even if smaller numbers come over, for four years, five years, three years, two years worth of their care, it will bring significant costs. And we're already under pressure. I'm sure you've all seen the headline news about how we're struggling for finances for the Manx care. And this would be a case of, well, what gives if we provide that care? We are worried about We don't know exactly what it will mean, but we are worried about it. A slightly technical one um, is that if the UK doesn't have assisted dying, but we do, then any doctor that helps with assisted dying on the Isle of Man is liable to prosecution if they help somebody on the Isle. So if they work in the UK and they're an Isle of Man resident and they provide information that helps an Isle of Man resident get assisted dying, they could be liable for prosecution in the UK. And not being funny, if I lived in the UK and had an Isle of Man resident, I wouldn't touch him with a barge pole. Why would I? You know, I don't have to. So you're not going to get prognoses, you're not going to get other stuff going on. It's going to make it difficult. The interface will be challenged by that. And anything that creates friction for our small island nation is difficult. We don't want it, we don't need it. 
So we're worried about what that means. Um, and given the fact that the, U the Isle of Man legislation requires the assessment of capacity by do doctors, you've got, to ref you've got to reference the fact that we haven't actually got it in place yet. So we're trying to get law where we haven't even got one of the major planks of the whole process in place yet, which is capacity legislation. If you also recognise that in the United Kingdom, uh, seven years after the introduction of the Mental Capacity Act, the law lords reviewed the Mental Capacity Act legislation and said, brilliant law, but you're rubbish. <laughs> seven years after putting it in, the UK were told that you don't do it very well. well so we've got to start from scratch with a new law to come in, to, which is all about death and dying, when we haven't got the background of experience that, that, that other people do, and then suddenly we're going to get perfect? I mean, maybe in the future we'll be miles better, but for the moment it's a deep concern that this newness of capacity legislation will put a real challenge to, to the safeguards that we might imagine might be in there. Uh, and lastly, prognosis. I will acknowledge I've got it wrong. I've got it wrong quite often, to be fair. The evidence is that, it, that we're very good as doctors of pointing out that someone's dying within hours or days. We do that well. If it's weeks or months, yeah, getting a bit worse. If it's years, we're really quite rubbish. Um, I, I've got an anecdote. I phone up a, a good um, friend and a uh, recent colleague of mine who um, is actually firmly in favour of assisted dying. So we had an ironic chat about this particular talk tonight. And I said to him, I'm going to raise your, your story. And he said, fine by me. So this is a doctor. So he got told 11, 12 years ago that he was terminally ill with less than a year to live. His immediate response was to give all of his money to his children. And when he didn't die, he stayed at work for a bit longer. <laughs> This was a really highly intelligent, highly trained doctor, told he had six months, totally believed it, and his life changed. So not being funny, you know, we get the diagnosis, the prognosis wrong, and the Isle of Man demands six months, and we can't get it right. Um, so I'm really worried that prognostication is incredibly difficult. And what happens if they invent a new drug out there? I mean, I remember when I was a, when a medical student, there was Hodgkin's lymphoma as a diagnosis. It was totally terminal. It was awful. Young people got it, they died. And then suddenly, bang, 95% survival, thank you very much indeed. So how do we know what's going to happen? So this prognostication and treatment is, is a really challenging concept, it really is. Um, so yeah, for the Isle of Man, these are my, my worries. So I had a bit of a Canadian thing in there, didn't I? I've got a lovely cousin called Kat, who lives in Canada. Um, I phoned her up to have a chat. She's slightly more ambivalent than me, but falls on the side of not liking it very much. Um, she had two anecdotes for me of young people. Well, one young person at the age of, of 18 that said a few years ago, I want to end my life. I was abused as a child. I've had a miserable time. And she was encouraged by a family friend to delay this decision until she was 25. And at 25 said, bloody hell, I'm glad to be alive. You know what? You make a choice, you can change your mind, really. But you can't change your mind if you're dead. Let's own that one. Um, and a similar one of a 93-year-old that felt like she was a burden to her family, wanted to, to end it all. She had enough criteria. And yet again, after a conversation, she chose life, not death, and she's delighted with still being alive. But these people could really easily suddenly be dead. Oh, one last anecdote as well. Um, a, a, um, another, another personal inter, uh, interaction. When I worked in, in London, I worked with a, um, a GP who was very Dutch indeed. He's a good lad called Tom. And uh, he said, I, got, I won't do the accent. I can do some, but not the Dutch accent. It's really hard. Uh, he said to me, I came to London because I couldn't handle granny walking in in the morning and being dead by the afternoon. And that was a GP. And he just, he just he had broke him and he had to leave he had to leave Holland. So that was a Dutch GP I worked with. He was the first person I ever spoke to about assisted dying. I didn't know much about it. And it was in about 2008 or 2009. So after it was bedding in, uh, in, in, in Holland. So those are my little anecdotes. I think my next slide is a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a surprise, but... Bear with, bear with. All right, all right. You might go, what's... Ironically, I find her one of those powerful advocates against assisted dying. Yeah, I do. And the reason I do is because she's really clever, she's really articulate, she has fantastic agency, she is fully supported, and she damn well knows what she wants and when she's going to do it. Vulnerable people aren't her. That's it. Vulnerable people aren't her. Vulnerable people don't have the support network, haven't got the, the media coverage, haven't got all the ability to speak their mind and get listened to. They're not going to be messed around. She is ultimately the complete reason why I really don't like the idea of assisted dying because she's not a vulnerable person in lots of ways. She might be old, she might have a terminal diagnosis, but she ain't vulnerable in lots of ways and she's got agency and can do what she wants. 
and other people don't. These The stories I was hearing of the disability that said, well, you can't have your home, but I can kill you instead. Huh? I mean, yes. Yes. I haven't, didn't go into one. That's just why I was going to talk a lot about coercion as well, because I do, you know, if, if ever you say a law, Shipman would love it. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Psychopaths would be delighted to be able to persuade people to kill themselves. Nice one. I could actually, I could get a knighthood for being, Shipman would get a knighthood for doing his job, wouldn't he? And if you ever say that, you've got to be ironic about the whole thing, say that's not a good idea, is it, really? Anyway, so there we go. So that's my Esther Ranson bit. Um, so I do have hopes for dying with dignity. Um, I, I do care about people. I hate pain and suffering. I really do. I believe in minimising pain. I believe in choice. Um, I do have a, you know, I, I had a colleague in the UK who used to walk into her office. I've got a problem. She said, ah, it's all right, but I always know you've got a solution. So I do come with a possible, you know, mitigation for the, for the journey. Um, how do we achieve a dying with dignity? Well, palliative care is, is excellent, and the vast majority of people that are offered good palliative care really do very well with it. Um, I'm also trying to promote a, 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 a piece of work via Manx Care, which involves advanced care planning, to make decisions when you can, to choose what you want when you don't want, to not be unnecessarily burdened by care that's inappropriate and horrible. So we have a conversation, what do you want? Well, the number of times I just opened a conversation with somebody, I had a conversation with a lady two days ago, and um, I said, what do you want? She said, well, frankly, I don't want to be here anymore. Okay, fine. Do you ever come back to hospital? I said, well, you're quite a nice person, Dr. Gary, but actually I don't want to see you ever again. Okay, let me just clarify. If you get sick, no, I don't want anything. I want to be at home and I want to be with my family and I don't want to be messed around. The number of times people say that. And then I see my experience as a doctor in, 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 in a geriatric medicine and most of the people who express those views have quite a dignified and reasonable dying. I, I, I'd it is my personal experience. The number of people who might benefit... And I always reference there might be some small number of people that might benefit from assisted dying, but the vast, vast, vast majority of us, actually, it's not that way. So I come to my final thoughts. And this is where, you know, the emotional argument in favour of assisted dying I find is very powerful. Pain bad, choice good, me want choice, me no want pain, I want it. My thoughts are equally emotional i can't handle the idea of people dying inappropriately unnecessarily early and leaving this mortal coil without the right time and place so in my scales i say how many people are you happy to let die inappropriately to allow one person their their their, their death that they want at their time and for me the answer is I, i'm not happy with anybody in, in the dying part to make up for people that want their own choice it's my views thank you Thank you very much, Duncan. So um, we're all going to sit over there now. Uh, and we have two people with, with some roving mics. And uh, so if you want to ask a question, I'm afraid we're going to have to do the, you know, raise your hand uh, and we will choose yeah, one at a time. Do really want everybody who wants to ask a question to have an opportunity to do that. So kind of need your help with that please so if you could keep your questions short um i know a lot of people have have stories to tell um but we don't really have time to hear big long stories tonight so if you could try and keep your questions as as short uh, and to the point as possible that would be fantastic just so everybody gets a chance to ask theirs um, if you do have a longer uh, story that you want to tell or some sort of longer discussion there will be an opportunity afterwards to come and speak to any any of us um, individually so uh, so yeah I'm going to go over there and then yeah please put your hand up if you want to ask a question I, I was quite horrified at uh, to hear how badly regulated the the whole thing was in Canada I mean the second sorry I've forgotten your name but uh, I mean the Isle of Man perspective was much more logical and certainly in Europe, you know, people have been going to Switzerland for a long time. And I mean, I know someone who went and, you know, it was sort of a long six month process to actually do it, not, not sort of just turning up. So I think, you know, we should be basing our decision not on how a badly regulated thing like in Canada, but, but where it's been happening for a, you know, a number of years. Um, as, as he said, you know, it, it's gone in a short time from 
no no uh, assisted dying to, to the most in the world, whereas the others have actually maintained a, a sensible manner of doing it. Well, you know, it's interesting because in Canada, when we were debating euthanasia assisted suicide, we were talking about the Belgium and the Netherlands experience because there was quite a few stories out of the Netherlands and Belgium which were quite concerning. And we were told, well, you know, we weren't going to get that in Canada. We were not, we were not going to get the Netherlands or Belgium experience, that it was going to be far different than that. And in fact, well, we're surpassing them. So, you know, the talk about where it can be far more sensible than the Isle of Man, I think that's sort of a funny sort of thing because that's what everyone says everywhere, and it doesn't happen that way. I'll give you a prime example. California. California legalized assisted suicide in 2016, so they hadn't legalized euthanasia. There's a little difference, right? Euthanasia is when the doctor does the act, and assisted suicide is when, or a doctor or a nurse does the act, because in Canada, nurses can do it. Assisted suicide is when they prescribe the lethal drugs, but you have to take it yourself. But if you look at California right now, first of all, a few years ago, they expanded their law. So they, they reduced their waiting periods. They expanded different things, and they did things. And now they have a bill right now they're debating in the California legislature to change it from assisted suicide to euthanasia to change the six-month definition to what we have in Canada, irremediable medical condition. And, you know, they're going to, if they actually pass that, they're obviously going to ignore the Canadian experience because we have the same things in Canada and they'd go the same route and you're going to see the same thing happen there. Uh, so there's two messages here. One, we said the same thing in Canada. They said, they, like, all our politicians said the same thing, all the ones who supported it. They said, oh, well, we won't do that in Canada. Well, they do it in Canada. Secondly, even in California where they had assisted suicide, not euthanasia, so obviously there is a bit of a regulation difference then, right? They're moving our way pretty quickly, and it just takes the next group of electors who come into the legislature with this new idea, and on it goes. The final thing is limiting it is discriminatory, and the Canadian situation shows that loud and clear. So if you can have it and I can't have it, then it's a discrimination to me if I have some sort of difficult condition. And guess what? We're human beings. So it's very difficult because we all go through difficult conditions at different times in our life, and some more than others, right? Some in a more so difficult way than others. And so now you're talking about trying to apply it to our human condition. Well, it doesn't work that way. We're not, we're not computers. Um, and you're asking doctors and nurses to make these decisions, life and death decisions about your life, all within this whole cultural milieu of equality and freedom and everything else, it doesn't work, doesn't happen. And then you say 10 years after legalizing, oh, I wish we hadn't done that. Well, it's a little bit late now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, my name is Lydia McGuinness. Um, I work for Manx Care. Um, I'm a social worker to trade. I've been working in the care field for 39 years. And a lot of my colleagues feel the same as me, who are nurses and, and working um, with terminally ill um, end-of-life patients. And I haven't yet come across a colleague who's in, in favour of the assisted dying bill. I just want to ask in a practical way, if most of my, my colleagues share the same view as me and they're against it. How on earth is it going to work if you're a doctor or a nurse on the island and this is brought in ethically, you're trained with your six C's and, you know, so I, I just don't know how, as my colleagues would, would, would go on if they say, I don't want to be part of this, will that impact on their, their um, employment here? Am I... Hi. Uh, we, 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 we looked at this in the um, Medical Society as well because we were very worried about this. There is a clause in the bill that says that you can be a conscientious objector. I don't know quite how they define that. I'd like to be an objector, definitely. Um, and th there's a clause that says that Manx Care can't unreasonably discriminate against you if you try and do it, but how do you in put these into practice in the, in the long term? I mean, there becomes a, a, a challenge on, on the process as well. I mean, I know that one group that's that's highlighted in the the clauses is psychiatry, um, and I, I do know the involvement with them has been limited in the clauses, with the presumption that because they are required, to, they're legally they are the legal second opinion. If there's a debate about it, if anyone's worried, then the psychiatrist has to give a second opinion. 
there's only about eight or nine of them that can do it. And if they all say, no, I'm not going to do it, how do you make the law work? I think on the other hand, we've got a real challenge actually making this, even if we were going to try and do it, physically making it work is an absolute nightmare. There's so many problems with it. And I, and I respectfully, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with the, the, the non um, mission creep idea on the Isle of Man. I don't know how we can safeguard ourselves from whatever happens everywhere else. And one lawmaker can't demand that it never changes because that's not their right. The next generation of lawmakers come along and do what they want. So I don't, I don't see how you could possibly stop mission creep. Once you go from living as a right, death being an obligation, to death being a right as well, you cross your Rubicon and you can't undo it. And then it's my pain, is my pain, is my pain. Don't tell me what I feel. You can't tell me. I want it too. And it becomes very difficult to argue against that. Does that, does that help answer at all? Question there. Hi. Uh, thanks. Um, I get the impression from the pro-assisted dying people that they think they're going to go out like a pet, where they're just going to just go to sleep. Can you give ideas of? There's been touted 380 tablets equivalent of digoxin and midazolam and all kinds of things like DDMA plus in Oregon. Um, can you give a reality as to what they're going to give and what's the experience and what are the parameters? How long are people taking to have this problem? Okay, so one of the reasons they want to change assisted suicide in California is because um, when the doctor actually administers it directly, it is actually a cleaner act, and they're acknowledging that. So the amount of suffering around assisted suicide is significant. Uh, the drugs uh, cause uh, a, a severe burning of the throat and a lot of pain and suffering as they're dying, et cetera. I don't, I don't want to get into any, any of the drug combination issues because obviously speaking, uh, these drugs in combination will kill you. And I don't think I want to talk about that. But you know, so that's why they want to go to euthanasia because it is cleaner in a sense because you're talking about actually injecting or using a drip to, uh, to have that put in the person. Um, but I was wanting to say to you that, um, so it's, and it's not easy. So in Canada, just so you know, what we did, because the Netherlands, there's, there's been several studies done on the death, deaths in the Netherlands, and they show that there had uh, been a fair amount of uh, problems, like uh, about 7% of the deaths, there have been serious sort of issues. And so what we did in Canada, had nothing to do with me, they decided to, in the package, so someone has ordered the package, the doctor's approved it, he gets the package, they have the double dose in there, it's a double dose package. So the doctor has to stay there administer, and if the person doesn't die within a certain period of time, they have to administer the second dose. And obviously speaking, now you've given them enough to kill an elephant, so obviously they're not surviving. The other thing about it is the drugs don't do as you think they do. We're told it shuts down the heart. It's not true. These drugs don't do that at all. What they do is they shut down the lungs. You actually die a death by drowning. But what they do is that you it's a multiple drug system. So you're, you're put into coma and you're put into paralysis and then the final drug to shut down your lungs. Uh, so what happens is, is that um, obviously when your lungs stop moving and they fill with fluids, then eventually within so much time you're going to die, and obviously then your heart stops beating. Um, so it's not what people are thinking. It's not like, oh, you know, you give a bit of drug and they die and so on. But it looks, they say, but it looks peaceful. Well, if they're going to put you into a coma, you're going to look pretty peaceful, right? So... I, I don't know a huge amount of it, but my, my brief understanding is there's a, there's a failure rate. So people don't actually get what they want out the other end, and it's not the body's not ready to go and it fights you. I'm not being funny. So if there's a failure rate and the body's fighting, it ain't going to be funny. So my understanding, what I heard from, from the, particularly when you take the tablets yourself, it, it can be an awful journey. Yeah, the, the longest death in Oregon was 104 hours. But often you get, every year you get some that are three days and that sort of thing, three days of waiting. But that's why, as I say, in the Canadian system, they use the double, the double drugs. I'm going to try, try to be short and sweet here. I, as a 79-year-old retired nurse and midwife, who in my latter years also was a palliative care nurse, not, not here on the Isle of Man, but in Somerset, I was extremely worried about this bill. So this is going to sound rather personal, but I actually rang Dr. Allenson. And the questions I put to Dr. Allenson were as follows. 
is he still a practising doctor and therefore on the General Medical Council register? His answer was yes. I asked him how, as an MHK and a minister, he found time to do all this and he told me how. I then pointed out to him that as a practising doctor, he had sworn the Hippocratic Oath and coupled with the fact that he is the current Isle of Man Treasury Minister and needs to make savings in certain areas, leaves me feeling very uncomfortable indeed and that I found his combination most sinister. Sorry, can, I, can I interrupt just a minute? Um, <laughs> I'm very keen that we don't get too personal I'm here. Sure. Um, so I will move on. Do you move on to your question? I will. I then rang the GMC for their opinion. This took a long time since they were not happy initially to speak with me as a non-doctor. However, I pressed my case and eventually I was told on this subject at this time, we can give no opinion and you are anyway ringing from outside the UK jurisdiction. I then pointed out that the Isle of Man, Department of Health and Social Care, employs doctors from all over the UK and the world, and that all work under the same code of practice laid down by the GMC. Since Dr. Allenson had, on my questioning him, told me that the cause of death on the death certificate of anyone who had died by assisted dying would be stated as the disease from which the person was suffering and which had caused them to ask for assisted dying. I then rang the Office of Registration of Births and Deaths, only to be told that this was not a question for them to answer, but only for the legislation of the Isle of Man. NB, not to record the true cause of death on a death certificate is illegal in law and it amounts to fraud. Cause of death should read by assisted dying. My final point is that I next rang an insurance company to ask if they would pay out on a case of either suicide or assisted dying. The answer finally came back that evening having been obtained from the organisation which provides their code of practice for insurance companies. I was told that if the suicide or death by assisted dying had occurred within a jurisdiction in which either suicide or assisted dying had been legalised, then the insurance company would pay out on that life insurance. It seems to me that the goalposts are moving in the direction of support for assisted dying and suspiciously in favour of saving money on the end of life care budget, i.e. cash, not care, and killing, not care. On this point, I will cease. I'm going to make one comment only on that one, and, it, and it's something I, I agree with you as well. Um, I've heard the stories from Canada about the coercive nature of the of the system over there that encourages death, not care. And I'm, I'm always mindful of dead patients are cheap patients. And if you've got a system that's designed to be as cheap as possible, then there are unforeseen consequences. So I don't dismiss your anxiety. It's a question for Duncan. Um, do you foresee the fact that um, in, when it comes to research, that they'll be less inclined to research into medical advances if the conditions that are, if the per patients' are, uh, conditions are terminated before? Uh, uh, you mentioned that there was a, um, a drug that came in for Hodgkin's. Could you have foreseen that not happening because of assisted dying? Would that be the the trend for the if, pharmaceutical companies? I think it's a reasonable presumption that if, if, if all the people with a condition are encouraged to die, there's no one left around, there's no one to test anyway. 
So I think you're right, and they won't look into it at all. So I think that there are definitely a lot of unforeseen consequences to, to, the, to this kind of legislation, and I think I agree with you. And Alex, can you foresee the doctors being paid to, to do the assisted dying if there are not enough doctors willing to do it voluntarily? Okay, the doctors are going to be paid anyway to do it. So the whole payment system is based on a multiple payment system because, uh, you know, you, they would be paid to do their, um, the assessment. Uh, they would be paid to do the act. They'd be paid so a doctor who does the secondary assessment would have to be paid. In, ca in fact, in Canada, they, they can ca claim a for, up for up to five assessments for one person. So the assumption is that it might take more than one assessment to approve that person. Um, and so that's how it goes. So yes, uh, we've lost doctors in Canada because of this, because there's been quite a few doctors who refuse to participate, who've left our country. Quite a few of them I knew quite well. Uh, we've, uh, palliative care has lost a lot of doctors, well-trained, long-term palliative care doctors who've left palliative care, and not because they wanted to, but because they were being pressured to participate, and so they, they, they felt they had to get out. So, and that is a, that is a serious problem. But I'm going to say one other thing. Last weekend, I was speaking in Oregon, and that was very nice. Uh, and uh, Kate Kelly was at the conference I was speaking at. So who's Kate Kelly? So 24 years ago, in the year 2000, Kate Kelly had cancer, and she was given six months to live. And Kate had voted in favor of assisted suicide because they had a plebiscite in, in Oregon. She voted in favor. She, her, uh, her aunt had recently died of cancer, and her mother had Alzheimer's. And she decided she did not want treatment. She just wanted assisted suicide. And so she went to a, uh, the oncologist. The oncologist said to her, well, you know, you come back and talk to me about it. We'll discuss it. Well, he's, and he found out that Kate had a son who was at the time in police college. So he said to Kate, well, Kate, I understand you. You want assisted suicide. She says, absolutely, I want it. I'm, I have six months to live. I want assisted suicide. I qualify. You know, he would have had to assess her. It might have been a bit of a break, maybe. But he said, well, you know, if you try treatment, Kate, I can guarantee you that you can be at your son's graduation. She said, oh, well, I will try treatment then. So she changed her mind from saying no to treatment. Now, not everyone gets better. I understand that. In her case, she did very well, and she ended up going into full remission. And she was at the conference 24 years later saying to me, Alex, I'm so happy to be alive. 24 years ago, I qualified for assisted suicide, and I wanted to die. But the doctor convinced her, based on her son being in police college, to try treatment. She got better, and she's happy to be alive. 24 years later. Can I? Uh, I'm going to say something a bit selfish on this one, because um, I am aware of the stories of defunding of palliative care in, in Canada. I think there's an inevitable consequence when new people die not needing palliative care, then why would you need palliative care? Um, if you look at all the jurisdictions that go down the route of assisted dying and euthanasia, it's about 1 in 20, 5%. So that leaves 95% of us that still don't do that, and we die naturally. So I'm selfish. I want a good palliative care service to look after me and the 95%, thanks very much indeed. And I don't see why we have to direct all of our funds and money onto the 5%, not the rest of us. A bit selfish, but that's my view. So if you had a... Um if you had a pro-euthanasia speaker here tonight from Canada, they would tell you that we've increased funding to palliative care. And technically speaking, they'd be correct. But just so you know, the palliative care, the, the codes that they use to pay a doctor to do euthanasia are all palliative care codes. So I wrote about this recently because I didn't, I didn't you know, I'm not a doctor, so I asked a, a, a palliative care doctor who I knew, can you send me the codes that they use for billing for euthanasia. So this doctor sent me the codes, and she made the note, you'll notice they're all palliative care codes. So my own province of Ontario, Ontario is the big, biggest province in Canada, right? 39% of Canadians live in Ontario. It's all palliative care codes, and our premier often says, we've increased funding to palliative care. I have no idea how much of that money is going to palliative care and how much goes to medical aid and dying. I don't know. All I know is his palliative care codes, and he can say all he wants, he's raised funding to palliative care, but he hasn't. Okay, so we have, we have one question up top. It is 
after 10 past eight. So I did say we were going to stop soon after eight. So maybe just two more questions. So we have one at the top there. Um, my wife is a doctor. She was, she's a psychiatrist and I was supposed to pick her up at 6.30, but I got a text from her saying, um, I'll read it to you. Pick up is cancelled. I've just been called to assess a suicidal lady. So I extend her apologies for not being here today. I have come from the UK, just been here a year, and I'm a former politician and a polit political commentator. And my question, probably to Duncan, since you're the local man, is why are people not rising up to get rid of these MHK, MHKs who want palliative care and want um, assisted dying? Why isn't there a political movement? We're only two years away from an election. Please, answer the question. So, I, th I think the only answer I can say is, is while I've been a resident on the Isle of Man for just over four years, I'll never be Manx, and I try to understand. <laughs> Can I, can I answer that yeah, okay. one? Maybe, um, Could I just ask a we, related question? Can I, can I just answer that, that question first? <laughs> so um, we do uh, have at least two MHKs here tonight, and I'm really pleased to see them. Uh, there are many MHKs who are listening to us, just not enough yet. Uh, so, yeah, my encouragement to you and everyone here who, who feels the same is to make your voice heard to your MHK. Uh, if you're a healthcare worker, make your voice heard to uh, Laurie Hooper, uh, because it's only through people actually contacting their MHKs, uh, writing to them, emailing them, meeting with them, that they're going to hear the concern. And the and yeah, speak to your friends, speak to anyone else who'll listen and get them to do the same, because their thinking at the moment is that most people want this, and the feeling in this room tonight is that's not the case. So yeah. Me. is that what politicians listen to is whether they're going to be elected next time around. Yeah, well, you're their constituents, so they're going to, they should listen to what you, what you want them to do. <laughs> so, yeah, we have uh, one Alex, question here. Alex, you, you've met some politicians today. Um, could you give us an, your impression of, uh, <laughs> of the situation that we're facing? Thank you. Well, we actually had an informal meeting, so I don't know if it's my place to release that because it wasn't filmed <laughs> or it wasn't in, in, uh, in session type thing. So I, I think that uh, what, I, what I hear is you have 24 members and there were a good number there today, but you need to at least get 12 or 13 to say no. I guess you need 13. So you're not there yet. And so uh, it's like any, any situation the effect upon someone changing their mind is based on who they know. And I'll give you an, another big question. You know, I'll tell you right off the bat. I did a lot of lobbying in Canada on this question, and we were very successful at first. And then, of course, the, the euthanasia lobby decided to go to the courts to get decisions to move things along. And that's where they were successful with our courts in Canada and to get things moving along. Anyway. Um, but when I met with politicians, most of them actually, and I don't know if it's the same thing here, had actually never actually read the legislation. I'd be sitting down with them and they'd be talking about A, B, and C, and I'd say, well, well let's talk about what's actually in the bill. And I'd show it to them. I'd say, this is the bill, this is what it says. So are you comfortable with this? Because this is actually what it's saying, right? This is what it says. Because we can talk in theory all we want. I'm f in favor of assisted dying, I'm against assisted dying. We can talk in theory all we want. But the language of the legislation is the key. And the devil is in the details, right? And so the fact of it is, is that's, that's what I think is the most important thing. Sit down with them and go through it with them and say, are you actually comfortable with that? Because, you know, um, they're not. And I was just in uh, Slovenia. Now, why Slovenia? Slovenia has been de was debating a Canadian euthanasia bill. Like, it was very similar. It was actually crazy similar. And so I, I was brought to Slovenia, and I don't speak Slovenian, so whatever. I was there, and I spoke to a lot of, of uh, members of their legislature, one-on-one uh, -on -one and plus in a group, and they just voted their bill down. Okay, so, but the government, this was a government bill, though. That makes a difference. So they had certain members of the government who bucked against them and voted no. 
So they're going to go to a referendum, the government announced, which is sort of another crazy situation because how do you have a referendum on this question? It's a very difficult thing to have a referendum on. But anyway, um, once again, uh, meeting with them, talking to them, pointing out, I think that's powerful. So the sad thing about what's happened in Canada is, is, these, is how it's progressed with all these, well, I would say digressed, with all these stories and realities of people's lives. But if you actually go and read those stories, you can actually, if you go to my blog or you go somewhere else, you can actually link on the original story, share it with your elected representative, show them the original stories and say, now, how are you going to prove to me that this is not going to happen here? Because these aren't my stories I've made up. I didn't make up any stories. I just pulled them out of the media. And these are compelling stories. And of course, they can't promise you that it's not going to happen here. They could say, oh, we're going to do this, this, and this, and this. Okay. But what about five years after? I had the privilege of addressing certain members of the House of Keys, those who chose to come along, and I spoke to them about what the bill actually says. One thing that I, concerns me, we're using two phrases interchangeably, assisted dying and assisted suicide. I had some difficulty in persuading those who came along, that the bill is about assisted suicide because clause 10 in the bill makes it, uh, has a provision whereby if the bill is followed, they would not be liable for a prosecution under the Criminal Law Act 1981, Section 2, and it says in actual fact, abetment of suicide. So my first question is, do you agree with me that it is either assisted suicide, that is, if A helps B to die, but doesn't actually kill them, or it is euthanasia if A kills B and it's allowed by law. That's the first question. So can we use the word assisted suicide and persuade our legislators that that is what they're into, despite the title of the bill? The second point is, are you aware that on May the 17th, 2023, unanimously, our legislator, legislature agreed to a suicide prevention strategy, unanimously. And the strategy says there is always a better way. So can we understand a bill that has suicide provision strategy, that's what it is, and yet the legislature has a suicide prevention strategy, and more than that, both of them are going to cost public money, and I believe 91 million we were shortfall, and yet, can it be made known that the, you cannot have a suicide prevention strategy and a suicide provision strategy, for that is what is on the cards at the moment. I think I think we all agree. Um, one actually, the Alaman Medical Society submission to the bill committee made the point that the the heading "assisted dying" for the bill is actually misleading at best because the bill does uh, have provision for assisted suicide and euthanasia. Uh, and and actually, Dr. Anson himself um, said in the in the House when he asked for leave to introduce that what assisted dying is not, is a physician injecting something to cause somebody's death. And yet, and that... Yeah, yeah. So it should be called the assisted suicide and euthanasia bill, not the assisted dying bill. Yeah, so yeah, so I think we need to draw to a close. We're way past what and I said we'd finished. Really sorry about that. Um, but you all seem to be enjoying yourselves. So um, <laughs> yeah, so just, yeah, again, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> and thank you to our speakers. And uh, write to your MHKs, yeah? <laughs>